the body roams the mountains and the spirit is set free. Mountaineers from all over the world share the feeling of that old Chinese poem. Thousands have come here to the Peruvian Andes to explore and find freedom. The bodies of many of them lie unclaimed amongst these giants. This is the story of seven Canadians and their attempt to climb and record the first descent on skis from the summit of Mount Huascaran, 22,205 feet. It's named after one of the mightiest Incas and stands as the second highest peak in the Western Hemisphere. Every year, Huascaran takes an average of three lives. It's not a friendly place. So why risk it? on skis? A difficult question. With no real answer. Peter Shinovsky. Back in 1973, I saw this mountain for the first time. And I was 16 at the time, and I mentioned to my parents, I really wanted to ski it. Well, they laughed and everybody else did too. But last year I managed to ski a smaller glacier in Peru. And it turned out to be a lot of fun. So last fall I got, got together with Peter Robson and we decided to do the big one this year. He showed me some photos he had from last year and I just said, well, we have to do it. They come from one of the most prosperous countries in the world to one of the poorest. The contrast is startling. The Canadians appear affluent to the Peruvians, who call them gringos. They feel conspicuous. Their clothes are different, their skin and their language. Although the two skiers have been preparing for months, the rest of the group have had much less time to get organized, as little as three weeks. They buy food for the climb in the native markets. The ritual of haggling is a rather ironic experience for these North American consumers. The film crew are not mountain climbers, or even skiers, so they brought a climbing instructor with them. And now, in Lima, under his direction, they train, continuously. Running, jogging, push-ups, sit-ups, more running, up and down steep coastal trails. They listen to the government geologists, who brief them on the hazards of the mountain. The geologists want more detailed information on some of the larger crevasses, and the Canadians agree to take photographs for them. And twice, three times. And more training. Rope techniques. Okay. 
Okay, now that can be slid up and then you can stand on it because it only goes one direction. They practice with determination. Try that. Hoping they will remember enough later when they really need it. In the wind, in the cold, in the dark. By truck, they travel inland, towards the mountain. Huascaran is part of a range of mountains, called the Cordillera Blanca, the White Range. To reach it, they must cross over the lower Black Range, hills that lie between the mountains and the Pacific Ocean. Such was the violence of the crumpling of the Earth's crust when the Andes were created, that there's a difference in altitude of 40,000 feet between mountain peak and sea bottom. The road ends at a village called Musha, at an elevation of 14,000 feet. Here, the Canadians hire donkeys to carry their equipment to the base camp, which is to be located just below the glacier. The villagers long ago became accustomed to groups of foreigners passing through on their way up the mountain. Everything has to be carefully repacked. Everyone helps, and even the village band turns out. The journey to the base camp shouldn't have been difficult, but the abrupt change from sea level to over 14,000 feet leaves them breathless and exhausted. The trail seems to be well marked, and so the film crew is not too concerned when the donkeys pull ahead out of sight, taking the guides and warm clothing with them. The days are hot, but as soon as the sun sets, the temperature drops to freezing. This rapid cooling combined with the thin air can cause body temperatures to drop dangerously low. If you don't have something warm to put on, hypothermia may set in, a condition that's difficult to reverse and can result in death. As it gets dark, they realize that the worst has happened. They've missed the trail and are lost. Okay, how faint is it? It's a very faint mark. Okay, Glennon, we have, we think we know where you are. Find the river. And as you look up the peak, you should go to the left, I repeat, to the left side of the river. From there, your direction should be up. Without the few matches and money that they used to kindle a fire, they would not have survived that first night. Several hours later, they stumble into base camp.
This small campsite is the only area at this elevation, 16,000 feet, suitable for a base camp. The Canadians are crowded in with mountaineers from many different nations, all trying to adjust to the extra strain on their lungs. Water is plentiful from glacial streams that freeze each night. It makes bathing a breathtaking experience. After the narrow escape of the first night, the responsibilities of Glenn, the safety and technical advisor, are defined even more carefully. Okay, well basically I'm here to act as an advisory in the technical um, equipment and also to advise in safety situations. Uh, if the inexperienced people here get into a situation they don't know how to handle, I can either advise them how to handle it or if it's too dangerous, pull them out of the situation. Arthur, the director of the film, spends long hours checking and rechecking the camera equipment. In this thin air, Arthur and others begin to suffer the symptoms of oxygen starvation, nausea, and headaches severe enough to waken them at night. At this altitude, lack of cloud cover means high levels of ultraviolet light, harsh enough to blacken unprotected lips and noses. It's here that the Canadians meet Keith Hand and the expedition from Pittsburgh. They bring news of two other groups of skiers not far behind who are racing up the mountain to be the first to ski from the summit. The Canadians decide to move on even though they aren't ready. And according to climbers returning from the top, the conditions ahead are bad. Now the, the condition are, was good five days ago, and uh, now with the sun, there is, it's, not so, it's not so good, it's finished, you know. You have to go uh, over 5,300 meters to, to find snow and uh, crevasses closed. <laughs> now, after that, under that, it's open everywhere. It's, uh, I, I don't want to say it's dangerous, but uh, you really have to take care if you don't know too much about mountains. Uh, take care of that. Use the rope from up the moraine to the, to the camp and to the saddle. Yes. You have to do that. Do you recommend crampons all the way up? Yeah, yeah. crampons everywhere. everywhere. They can afford to wait no longer. They pack their gear and begin the steep climb up the rocky trail towards the glacier. No, no, right, that's too slippery. They time their pace to their breathing, slow and steady. As they climb, the altitude sickness grows worse.
At the edge of the glacier, they stop to put on their crampons, divide into teams, and rope themselves together. Even these simple tasks seem to take forever and are unbearably exhausting. Don't start having a big bunch of slack, or your ropes will start to tangle. Can you focus on this wide one? Huh? They agree that in their condition they cannot possibly negotiate the ice field and continue to use their heavy film cameras. They pack them away. The glacier is a maze of jagged ice folds, so confusing that it's difficult to maintain their sense of direction. They find hundred foot deep crevasses and great walls of snow and ice thrown up in their path. The summit seems remote and almost unattainable. Seven hours later, at 18,000 feet, they reach the first of three campsites on the way to the top. They probe what seems like solid ground and find several deep, snow-covered crevasses. Avoiding these, they set up the tents and settle in. The headaches and nausea grow steadily worse. Okay. Shoot, I wish they'd leave the climbing gear all together. <sighs> that your vest? Yeah. Temporary relief is provided by the rations of oxygen they allow themselves Johnny, from the small tank bottles? they carry. Their safety advisor warns them that the only permanent cure for altitude sickness is to go back down and that prolonged oxygen starvation can result in brain damage. Well, John, I mean, do you want to reconsider? Well, what do you think? If all those guys I've met, if 75% have been sick, and they've said that you've got to tra traverse places and there are ice falls and God knows what, I'm first? stretching it too far beyond what I told my family I would do, right? So that's it. A group of exhausted climbers on the way down from the top stop long enough to tell the Canadians about the avalanche that nearly buried them, about the crevasse that opened under their tent in the night, and about the frostbite that blackened their feet. It's the last straw. The film crew decide to turn back. The two skiers want to continue on. They take the camera and begin the difficult climb toward the summit alone. Before long, they have company. A group of French skiers have caught up with the Canadians. The race is on, but the Canadians can't keep up the grueling pace. First one turns back, and then at 20,000 feet, the other. The French push on, ignoring the traditional zigzag route that traverses up the mountain in favor of their own route, straight to the top.
They carry only their skis and some chocolate. No food, no tents, no sleeping bags. They reach the peak, 22,205 feet. They put on their skis and start down. It's an incredible moment, the first time that these slopes have ever been skied. But it's so steep that normal skiing is impossible. At this altitude, such a maneuver takes seven times more energy than at sea level. A superhuman feat. They spend that night huddled together in the shelter of a crevasse and return to base camp the next morning barefoot. Someone has stolen their climbing boots stored at the edge of the glacier. So you made it to the Patrick Van Alcan, the leader of the group, very, very nice. is elated about yeah? their experience. Yeah, A silence descends on the base camp. The Pittsburgh expedition had started up the glacier, and because of altitude sickness, all but three had turned back. Bob Klein, Joe Calder, and Keith Hand continued on. They reach the top at dusk. Now they're missing. The next morning, Bob's body's discovered 2,000 feet below the summit. Several days of searching fail to locate the other two. All that's found are their crampons and a length of rope neatly coiled. Pittsburgh, the home of Denise Hand, Keith's widow. If it were up to me to choose for Keith the type of life that he would live, and if the choices were a nine to five job and watching TV at night, and maybe going to a movie and dinner on the weekend, or the enormous satisfaction that he enjoyed as a result, of the activities that he did engage in, then I would, I would, I would choose, I would choose the way that he did live. I wouldn't change it. Because the, the difference, and I realize that this really does sound corny, but the difference is really between, you know, existing and living. And Keith had such a, a gift for living. He was always so aware of, you know, capturing the moment, you know, like as though each one would, would be the last. And I 
the quality of life was was important to Keith. The challenge of the mountains. For some, it will always mean the difference between existing and living.